Our Father, we thank you for our Bible study. Thank you for the opportunity you give us in all the circumstances of life to still create the time to come to listen to your word and to study the word together. We are praying that your spirit will reveal deep things in your word to us tonight in Jesus' name. We are praying, O oh Lord, that our circumstances and our home and what we left behind and what we still want to go back to do at home will not hinder us from getting the best from you in Jesus' name. Grant us the first love, first love for you, first love for your word, and first love for fellowship in the church in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, that our worship, our study will not become formal like the people that do not know you, but that we'll have deep devotion with you and with one another as we study your word in Jesus' name. Let your spirit take over and reveal to us what we need to strengthen us in our Christian life in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. It's been a privilege to come together every Monday to study the Word of God. And we'll be studying from the first epistle of Peter. For those who have been coming for some time, I've been reminding you every time, and I still need to do that for the benefit of those who have not been here before. Peter was one of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw the Lord face to face, and the Lord called him. And the Lord assured him he was going to make use of him. Before he left, he told them that the Holy Spirit will give all these apostles all the remembrance of the things he had taught them. Not only that, he will guide them into all truth. And the record we have in the Gospels as well as in the Epistles is just the fulfillment of what Jesus told them, reminding them of the things he had told them that you'll find in the Gospels, guiding them into all truth that you'll find in the Epistles. And now we come to the epistle of Peter. Uh, Peter in particular had been told by the Lord to feed his lamb. Lovest thou me more than all these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. Peter, Simon, son of Bajuna, do you love me more than all these? Yes, I love you the second time. Then feed my lambs. And then the third time, you still love me. The way you profess, yes, Lord, I do. You know all, you know my heart and you know all things. Then feed my sheep. And it is in feeding the sheep that he now wrote this epistle. These people were scattered in various places of Asia Minor. And they were facing persecution. And the world was hostile to them. And he needed to tell them how they would live in the hostile world. That's the reason he has been giving them all these exhortations and warnings and encouragement. So that they will be able to know how to live their lives. Actually, Peter was concerned about how these believers will live in the period of their suffering and persecution. He wanted them to remember the second coming of the Lord. Because the Lord had assured his own disciples that he's coming again. And not only that, he told them, he showed them the manifestation of that when he took Peter, James, and John to the Mount of Transfiguration. And eventually he was able to see that the Lord definitely will come again. Not only that, he told them, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. When I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming again so that I'll receive you unto myself. And then as Peter looked at the present situation, and then he looked at their precious salvation, and then he looked at the coming of the Lord, uh, the, the second coming of the Lord. He wanted to prepare the people so that they will be ready for that time. And because they didn't know the time it will come, because Jesus Christ himself had said, even the angels do not know, he didn't know, but it's known only to the Father in heaven. Therefore, they needed to prepare every time, because he could come any time. That's why in this passage we're looking at today, in First Peter chapter 4, verses 7 to 11 is talking about perpetual readiness for Christ's return. Not only that you are ready today and then you are not ready tomorrow. Perpetual readiness. Doing everything necessary, everything possible, that you'll be ready every time. Look at verse 7, chapter 4. But the end of all things is at hand. He told them it's very near. And if it was very near at that time, many years ago, then we know it will be very, very, very near today. 
in the present circumstances then, as he wanted them to understand the imminent return of the Lord. So also should we put in mind and always think about it that the Lord is coming very soon. And when he comes, he's going to reward everyone according to his works. By the way, when he said the end of all things is at hand, what did he mean? He meant that a probationary period here on earth, a time of trial on earth, a time of temptation on earth, even persecution and suffering at the end of all those things is at hand. The persecutors will not continue forever. The end is at hand. Even their persecution, their suffering will not last forever. The end is at hand. The power of the oppressors will not last forever. The end is at hand. And then he wanted them to know that whatever they were going through, it was just for a short space of time. There was absolute certainty in his heart. And there is absolute certainty in the hearts of the people that believe God today that our Lord Jesus Christ is coming again and is coming is very near. Is coming very, very soon. That's why we use that word imminent. It means very close at the door, very near. It can happen any moment from now. That was to be an incentive for holy living during their persecution and suffering. We are to endure our trials in the light of the imminent return of Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to live every moment as if Christ may come today. You pray as if that may be the last prayer. You study as if that may be the last study. You do good to your neighbors as if that may be my last opportunity of doing good. You love as if that might be the last opportunity, the last thing I do before the coming of the Lord that will round up everything I've been doing to give me eternal reward. You live as if every moment were the last moment, the last chance to glorify God on earth, the last opportunity to live in holiness and to suffer for the Lord. The end of all things is at hand. But you know, Peter didn't just stop there. He didn't tell the believers, the end of all things is at hand, period, finalized, finished. No, he said, as a result of that, there are some things that you will normally want to do. What are those things? Verse 7, be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. In verse 9, use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man has, has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. That God in all things, in all things we do, in all things we say, in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. And that's what Peter was telling those disciples. And that's what Peter is telling us today by the instruction and the teaching and munition of the Spirit of God. There we have divided the study these verses we have read into three parts. Number one, the priority of living like Christ. Christ is coming. And his coming is imminent. And therefore we have number one. The priority of living like Christ. Number two. The precondition of love towards Christians. Precondition. If we are expecting the coming of the Lord. There is a condition that precedes our readiness for the coming of the Lord. That is the precondition of love towards Christians. All Christians. Number three. The prerequisite. It's a requirement, but it is a requirement that comes before we'll be able to see Christ. It's the, pre uh, the prerequisite of loving, laboring for Christ. Laboring for Christ. Let's start from number one. And we're looking at number one, the priority of living like Christ. In First Peter chapter 4, uh, reading there in verse 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober. And watch unto prayer. Here he, he emphasized the fact that uh, the, the time had been going. And the end of all things actually was even at that time at hand. Maybe you are wondering, uh, many years have gone, more than a thousand years have gone. And yet the Lord has not come. 
Well, don't join the scoffers because that's exactly the problem of the scoffers. Because the scoffers are always from wondering that, uh, after all, it's been said for a long time, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. But Peter is saying, don't join them. A thousand years is what they look like one day. And the Lord's calendar is not like your calendar, not like my calendar. And the word of God is still true, it's coming again, and it's coming very soon. It says, the end of all things is at hand. Actually, what, the, uh, what Peter is saying is that the time is short. You don't have a very long time to prepare for eternity and to prepare for the coming of the Lord. It's the same thing that Paul emphasized in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, reading from verse 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. The time is short, which means at the end of all things is at hand. Because the time you have on earth, the time you have to do everything the Lord wants you to do, that time is short. It remains that both they that have wives be as though they had none. It is telling you that the very fact that the time is short, the very fact that the time of the coming of the Lord is at hand, the very fact that the end of all things is at hand, it will bring some conclusion, some corollary, and some events in your life. In the case of Peter, he said, Therefore, because of that, you be sober and watch unto prayer. Here he is telling the people, and the things you have, don't let those things become distractions to disturb you from serving the Lord. In verse 30, it says, And they that weep, as though they wept not, and they that rejoice, as though they rejoice not, and they that buy, as though they possess not. And then it says, and they that choose this world, the things of this world, clothing, material things, houses, money, whatever, as not abusing it for the fashion of this world passes away. And so we understand that if the time is short and the time of the coming of the Lord is very near, it will bring some action out of you. It will bring some uh, responsibilities out of you. Because you do not want to, him to meet you without doing what he wanted you to have done. In Romans chapter 13, reading there from verse 12. The night is fast spent, the day is at hand. The day of the coming of the Lord, it's at hand. The day of reckoning, it's at hand. The day when the Lord will come, he will examine us one by one. Every word we spoke, every action we put forth, every work of our hand, every service for the Lord. Everything we did every time, whether we did it to the glory of the Lord, with an eye focused on the Lord or not, that day is at hand. The day is at hand. Let us, therefore, uh, do, do you see the writing of the apostles by the Spirit of God? Every time they reminded us, the day is at hand, the end of all things is at hand, the time is short, it will bring a conclusion. They will say, as a result of that, this should be the action of the believer. It says, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife, not in envying. It's saying, let there be no worldliness, let there be no carnality. Let there be no action similar to the actions of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles don't know anything. They think they are here now. They die like a dog. And everything is forgiven at the end of life. They don't know. They don't understand. There is a future beyond the grave. But you know, therefore, don't live like them. That's why it then says in verse 14, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the laws thereof. Uh, the, 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 the thing that the apostles are reminding us is that the time is very short. The, the Lord is coming. And as a result of the coming of the Lord, if you actually believe the coming of the Lord, it will affect your character. It, it will affect everything that you do. It will affect where you go, what you do, what you say, how you serve the Lord. In Philippians chapter 4, from verse 5. Philippians chapter 4, verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Why, Paul? Why am I going to be moderate in everything I do? Because the Lord is at hand. Every time these apostles remind us of the coming of the Lord, they call us to our responsibility. 
The Lord is at hand. Therefore, children of God, let your moderation be known unto all men. Be careful for nothing. Be anxious. Be worried for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. He said, the Lord is coming. Don't be anxious about the things of this world. Don't be worried about the things of this world. And don't be worried about what others have, what others do not have. Don't envy them. Don't be jealous of them. Be satisfied with what you have. Be content with what you have. And the peace of God in verse 7, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, because the Lord is coming. Finally, brethren, because the Lord is at hand. Finally, brethren, because the end of all things is at hand. It will not continue here forever. Whatsoever then, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. What are you going to think on all these things? Because your actions are determined by your thoughts. It's what you think about that will determine the quality of your life. Therefore, it says, if you want the quality of your life to be that quality of life that will meet the precondition, the prerequisite of the coming of the Lord, here are the things we are going to be thinking about. The things that are true and honest. And the things that are just and pure. And the things that are lovely and of good report. And the things that are virtuous. And the things that are glorifying unto the Lord. Every time they remind us that the Lord is coming. They also remind us we must not fold our hands and be spiritually idle. And to do nothing. There must be a consequence of your knowledge that the Lord is coming again. As you have been hearing that the Lord is coming again, do you read your Bible more? Do you serve the Lord more? Do you pray more? Do you love the brethren more? Does your life show that you really have uh, what it takes to be ready for the coming of the Lord? In James chapter 5, James chapter 5, reading from verse 8. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. You see this again. It says, James is telling us, the coming of the Lord is drawing near. He said, yes, I know that. Yes, I believe that. And James says, no, you don't. If you really do, you'll be patient. You'll establish your heart. Because there is a corollary uh, to the understanding and to the fact that the Lord is coming again. There is a consequence. There's something you do because you know the Lord is coming again. Be also patient. Patient in your trial. Patient with people around you. Patient in your circumstances. Patient in your pursuits. Be patient. Establish your heart in the doctrine, in the word of the Lord. Why are you doing that? Because the Lord is coming, is drawing near. Grudge not against one another. If you knew the Lord was coming again, you will not grudge against one another. Because, you know, after all, it's just a few days. You know, remember when you were in the school, maybe secondary school. And uh, it was tough in the secondary school. The principal will put some discipline on you. The class teacher will do his own. And any teacher will do that. And the senior boys will also do that. And even when you go to the last class, the hefty, bulky ones, they also do some things. And eventually you are counting days. And you said, well, it doesn't matter anymore. I can endure that. I can take that. And you are counting days. The end is at hand. It will not be long. And the Lord will come again. And then you said, it remains just about two weeks now. And then you are counting, it remains ten days and five days and two days. And then you said, they are soon going to release us. And when I get out of that gate, all this punishment and all this, everything is over. That's exactly what the apostle is saying. That the way you are thinking at that time, that the end is at hand. And therefore, all that those uh, senior boys or senior girls were dumping on you, everything will soon be over. That's why James is saying, don't, don't grudge. Uh, don't just forget about it. Just overlook it. After all, it's just for a short time. It says, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. It's, in, it's so near. And if you have spiritual eyes to see, you will see that the Lord is standing close at the door. In Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, reading there from verse 10. It says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, that means suddenly unannounced, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the walls that are therein shall be burnt up. 
seen then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought she to be in all holy conversation and godliness, knowing that we're looking for the coming of the Lord, looking up, because the coming of the Lord is drawing near. What godly life we ought to live, what holy lives we ought to live, is something we're told in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 12, it says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly loss, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I've been pointing to you from scripture that every time the coming of the Lord is mentioned, it is not mentioned in isolation. It's not that I believe it as a doctrine. It should have an impact, an influence, an effect in your life. I believe the Lord is coming. Therefore, that draws me out of myself. I'm looking for the coming of the Lord. Therefore, that gets me into the responsibility of the Christian life. Actually, that's what he himself had said before he left in Luke. Reading in Luke chapter 21. Reading there in verse 34. He told his own disciples that, uh, the coming of the Lord was not just something they believed was mental assent. Yet, like I believe in the Father, I believe in the Son, I believe in the Holy Ghost, I believe He died, I believe He was buried, and He rose again. And like Paros, we just read it over. It must have an effect, an impact, an influence in our lives. In Luke chapter 21, Luke 21, reading verse 34, and take it to yourselves. Lest at any time your heart be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that they come upon you unawares. Here the Lord was talking, talking about that final day, the day of reckoning, the day of the coming of the Lord. He said, The Lord will be coming, and He was announcing to them that He will come again. You don't want that day to come upon you unawares, unprepared, not ready. As a result of that, you take it yourself. You mind your action. You mind your life. Lest at any time, at any time, you don't know when it will come. Lest at any time, your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness. A Christians don't take alcohol, but money can intoxicate you like alcohol. Position and your new degree can intoxicate you like alcohol. Your master's degree, doctorate degree, can, can intoxicate you like alcohol. And, and the things you have in life, it may even be little things like dresses, like you've just gotten married, you've just got a child, or you've got this achievement and this success, and this is happening and that is happening. It may intoxicate you like alcohol. That's why he's saying, let not your heart be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that they come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch it therefore. Therefore, because the Lord will come, because he can come at any time, uh, there is a consequence of that in your life. And pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these sin that shall come, that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Come back to First Peter chapter 4, reading there in verse 7. In 1 Peter chapter 4, reading in verse 7, it says, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. He called them so sobriety. That word, is sober, is telling us something. It says, be serious minded, be careful, be thoughtful. It's saying, let the fact of so much importance make a solemn impression upon your mind so that it will preserve you from frivolity and levity and vanity. That's why it says, be sober in your outlook, in your dressing, in your comportment, in your appearance, in your interaction, in your relationship, in your activities, everything you do, be sober. There should be no frivolity. Are, are you not expecting the coming of the Lord? Do you want him to meet you uh, doing what the Gentiles do? Talking like the Gentiles talk. Dressing like the Gentiles dress. Uh, be, get rid of the frivolity and the levity and the vanity. Be sober means in biblical language, it means to live a balanced, well-regulated life. It means to avoid fanaticism on one hand and lukewarmness on the other hand. You are sober. You are walking in the middle of the road. You are not in this extreme. You are not in that other extreme. You are fully given to the Lord, fully yielded unto the Lord. It means you are also going to have a sound mind. 
you're having all your desires, all your passions under the control of the spirit and the teaching of the scriptures of the word of God. It means to be sober, you have, you are following sound scriptural reasoning. In all your actions, in everything you do, it means you are exercising a watchful care over your character, over your conduct. Why are you doing that? Because you want to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Actually, believers in the early church, and that is why they didn't entangle themselves with the affairs of this sinful life, the practices of this sinful world. And then uh, Peter said another thing, number one, he said, because of the coming of the Lord, be sober. And then number two, he said, watch unto prayer. Because the Lord is coming again. You are praying that nothing will hinder you. Nothing will disturb you. You are bringing your life to the altar every time. And you are repacking your load every time. You are checking up your load. You know, when you get to the airport and if you are going through the security, they say, did you pack everything in this box yourself? You say, yes. After you did the packing, did you leave the box for another person to put something inside that you are not conscious of? You say no. Then they open it and they begin to check up. That's what he's saying. Watch unto prayer. He's saying hey, you pack your load, you made the consecration, you put everything in place because you are thinking about the coming of the Lord. Is it not possible that your wife has put something in that load that you are not conscious of and now your life is being derailed? Is it not possible your husband, by the interaction and the talking and everything that happens at home, has put something inside your load that shouldn't be there that will disqualify you from passing through that immigration to the eternal city? Is it not possible that even Satan he could have slipped something in the cares of this life? That is why you get back on your knees and you look at that load again. You see the way I packed it when I became converted? When I made my first consecration? When I became sanctified? When I was filled with the Holy Ghost? When I laid everything upon the altar? When I said my life, my mind, my body, my past, my present, my future, my family, everything I have, everything I will ever have, I lay it upon the altar. Is my load still like that? Is the box still like that? Because of the nearness of the coming of the Lord. The near approach of the end of all things is sin. You need to make a serious, prayerful commitment to the Lord again every day. Because you know that the Lord is coming. And you need the assistance of the Spirit of God. So that you will be able to pray as you ought to pray. We go to point number two. The precondition of love towards Christians. Remember, Peter is talking about the coming of the Lord. And he's talking about... Readiness for that coming of the Lord. The precondition. What's a precondition? The dictionary defines it as a condition that is required to exist for something else to happen. What's the something else to happen? The Lord is coming. The something else to want is I want to be ready when he comes. There will be no warning. He'll come suddenly. The trumpet will sound. The dead in Christ shall rise. And we which are alive will be caught up together with them. That's what I'm re getting ready for. And the precondition is that there will be love towards Christians. If you are going to be able to make it. Look at chapter 4 verse 8. First Peter. And above all things. Above all things. It said with every preparation you are making. With all the things you are doing. Here is an indispensable thing. Here is something that you must not do without. Above all things have Charity, not just ordinary charity, not just a normal charity, not just, a, oh yes, I have it, I love everybody, everybody knows uh, I, I love, and I don't have anything against anyone, that's not enough. Fervent charity. Can you say that your, your charity is fervent? Can you say it is hot? Can you say it is warm? Can you say it is inviting? Can you say it is attractive? Are people willing to come to your presence? Are people happy that you are there? And every time they come into your presence, they can see that love. Like he said later in chapter 5, be clothed with humility. Are you clothed with love? That your utterance, your appearance, your attitude, your relationship, everybody can say, I just like to be in the presence of that brother. I like to be in the presence of that sister. Because every time I get near, love Love just splashes on me. And it's so warm. And it's so fervent. And you, you, you can't miss it. It's always there. Have fervent charity among yourselves. Not in a small clique. 
not in the tribal way. Well, he's from my town. He's from my... Not, not that. Not that. Among yourselves. That uh, you are cheerful to everyone. You love everyone. The love is there. You splash it on everyone. And then it says, For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. And then it says that charity also will have a kind of practical demonstration. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Uh, you want to understand that this is the general thing of the scripture. Uh, this is something that the scriptures uh, say that if you have every other thing and you don't have this one, then you are not ready. If you speak in tongues, if you have faith to move mountains, if you know the mysteries of the depths of the knowledge of the things of God, and if you if you can prophesy about, you know, whatever will happen many, many years to come, and you do not have this charity, it says you are nothing. You are not ready yet. This is the precondition for readiness uh, for the Lord in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, reading there from verse 4. It says, when Christ who is alive, shall appear. Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And then he begins to tell you about things. You should just look at your load again. Look at that bag. And look at that box to pack. And remove the things that are there. That appear, that appear like the things of the world. And then he tells you. If some things are missing. Uh, you need to add them. If you want to be ready for the coming of the Lord. You may read the whole chapter on your own later. But go on to verse 12. In verse 12. Put on therefore. As the elect of God, holy and beloved, powers of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another, forbearing one another, forbearing one another. Uh, you want to be ready for the coming of the Lord? Uh, you, you have to overlook a lot of things. I told you about, uh, you know, those students who are about to pass out, they overlook a lot of things. You know, that's how the teacher always uh, behaves. That's how the teacher always accuses people. That's how the teacher always talks. But thank God, just a few days more, they overlook a lot of things. They call them to the assembly and the principal will talk and talk and talk. They look at one another, it will soon be over. They forbear, they forbear. They know it's for a short time. And somebody steps on their toes or somebody took, a, you know, a fork, a knife or a spoon or whatever. They are looking for it. Well, they said, never mind, forget it. It will soon be over. And that's what the Lord is saying. The Lord is coming, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel, against any, and that is a misunderstanding against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye, and above all, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, that's a belt that will uh, make everything firm on you, that will just uh, make you know that you are ready, ready to run the race, and ready to jump up, ready to go up when the Lord will come, that love is indispensable, so important, in First Peter chapter 1. Verse 22, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth to the Spirit unto unfeigned, unpretending uh, love of the brethren. No hypocrisy here. This sin is real. If you smile, you mean it. If you laugh, you mean it. If you express joy, you mean it. If you say, I'm praying for you. I love you. Every remembrance of you is just a joy in my heart. You mean it. If you say, Wonderful. I didn't see you last week. Isn't it wonderful when fellowship together? You mean it. And whenever you demonstrate love, you say, if you have any need, please contact me. Uh, if I can help and like to be of help, you mean it. There is no hypocrisy. There is no pretense. You are pouring out your heart. And the people can tell when they look at your face, when you smile, when you laugh. They know you mean it. They know you love them. That's the kind of love that will make it on that final day. It's a sea that she love one another with a pure heart, fervently, fervently. It means, uh, you know, that thing is so sincere, and that thing is so real, and there is nothing that you are putting up like an action, and then when you go behind that person, you say, don't mind him. He thinks that we actually love him. He doesn't know that we are just, uh, you know, carefully behaving so that he will not suspect that we have anything in mind. That will not get us ready for the coming of the Lord. The kind of love that will get us ready for the coming of the Lord is fervent, is pure, is sincere, without hypocrisy, without pretense. In fact, it tells us, it tells us the characteristics in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 
1 Corinthians chapter 13, reading from verse 4. This charity is long, sovereign long, and is kind. It envieth not. It wanteth not itself. It's not puffed up. You, you will not be proud. In fact, when you love somebody, if there is anything you have, which he doesn't have, and you know that if you talk about it, it will make him feel inferior, you will not talk about it. You will not mention it at all. If you know that you have been seeking something, he has been seeking something, you have not got it, and he has, you have got it, he has not got it, you will be very, very careful how you talk about it in his presence. There will be no pride. You will not do anything to pop up yourself to make the other fellow feel little, inferior, or to feel like nothing. In verse 5, he does not behave itself unseemly. He seeketh not her own. It's not easily provoked. It's a thinketh no, no evil. He rejoices not in iniquity. Rejoices not in iniquity. Uh, you hear that somebody is sick. You hear that somebody has uh, something wrong has happened. You will not say, uh -huh, God has caught him. I knew that will happen to him. It's not a good person. It's not a good sister. They just call her sister. You'll be very sad when something wrong, when something negative happens to your brother and to your sister. That's the kind of love that will prepare us for the coming of the Lord. He beareth all things. He believeth all things. He opens all things. He endureth all things. And that love never faileth. You know what that means? It means that love will not end at the end of the Bible study. Because during the Bible study, oh Lord, I thank you. I love everybody. I just appreciate everybody. And I pray, oh Lord, that this love will continue forever. And then we get outside there. Bible study ascended. Love ascended. Charity ascended. Charity never faileth. It continues at home. It continues in the place of work. It continues everywhere. And in fact, it continues to increase in First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, reading there from verse chapter 3 and verse 12. Chapter 3, verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and to abound in love one toward another and toward all men as we do toward you. To the end ye may, be, ye may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Uh, you see it relates it again to the coming of the Lord. That's why we need to love one another. Keep on loving and keep on loving and keep on loving. Please come back uh, to First Peter chapter 5 in verse 8. It says, For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. What does that mean? Uh, there are some people that think that means if I love, even if I'm not born again, that love will cover the multitude of my sins and I'll be able to get to heaven. That's why some people say, I do the best I can. I love everybody. I don't hate anyone. And without being born again, they think that that love will cover a multitude of their sins. No, that's a wrong interpretation. What this means is not about your sins being covered, but the sins of other people being covered. And then you, you still need to understand that too. Uh, you look at the other fellow. He's done some things wrong. And those things he did wrong were against you. Because of the love you have for him or for her. Your love will cover the multitude of sins that is sinned against you. That means you recognize that men and women are imperfect. And if it's just their imperfection, you are willing to just overlook. Just close your eyes to those things. Turn a deaf ear to those things as if you didn't hear, as if you didn't see. They were done against you. Your love for them will cover a multitude of sins. But it goes beyond that. If those sins now, if those falls, they go to not just imperfection. It becomes impurity that will lead them into hell fire. Then you want to do something. So that the Lord will be able to help them to realize that they have done evil. Look at James chapter 5. James chapter 5, reading verse 19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and won't convert him, let him know that he which converted a sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death. And what's the end of the verse? Read it aloud with me. And shall I the multitude of sins? That means this fellow has backslidden. The sins now are not particularly against you. 
They are not particularly against you. Therefore, you cannot say, I forgive you. Uh, but look everything. You cannot forgive a sin that is not against you. It's against the Lord. But you love him. And because of the love you have for him, you are praying for him. Because of the love you have for him, you approach him. And you talk to him tenderly. And you talk to him softly. And you talk to him convincingly. Telling him, this is not good. This is not right. Look at the word of God. Look at the Bible. This thing will land you into trouble with the Lord. And then he becomes convicted. He goes on his knees. You pray together. And then he is now converted. He is restored. His life is changed. Salvation comes to him afresh and new. That action of yours, which is a manifestation of love, will cover the multitude of sins. The Lord will say, I've forgiven him. That's what the psalmist was talking about when he spoke in Psalm 32. Psalm 32, reading verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. The sins are covered when, uh, you know, they are forgiven. And then because of what you have done, you have been able to help so that a multitude of sins now will be covered. But then it doesn't mean to conceal sin. It is the difference between covering offenses towards you and concealing sins that will destroy the church. By the way, do you know? Why the relatives, the children, the wife, and the people of Achan, why they were stoned to death and they died with Achan? Because they concealed the sin. The sin wasn't against them. It was against God and against the nation. And that wasn't a sin they should conceal or cover. If it's not personally against you, cover it, overlook it, turn a deaf ear, close your eyes to it, forgive, go your way. But if it is done against God, if it's done against the church, if it's God done against the nation of Israel, you cannot just close your eyes in Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 6. Deuteronomy 13, verse 6. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known thou, nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, near unto you, and far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent unto him, you will not compromise and sin, nor hearken unto him, you will not listen and be convinced to go and do evil, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shall thou spare him. Everybody read the latter part, the rest of the verse, verse 8. Neither shall thou conceal him, you will not say I'm going to cover that, no you cannot cover that one. It's telling you to go to immorality. It's telling you to go and worship idol. It's telling you to change the doctrine. That's not a sin against you personally. It's not stealing your money. It didn't abuse you. All the sin is, let's backslide. Let's do evil. Let's change the doctrine. That one, you cannot conceal. Come back to First Peter chapter 5 and verse 9. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Hospitality, what does that mean? It means you are taking care of other people. You are, your property, your food, and whatever it is, you are giving to other people. But it says, without grudging. Without grudging. Very important. You know, when people come to your house, and then you serve them food, and uh, then you eat together, that's hospitality. When you have something, you share with other people, that's, with, uh, that's hospitality. But then, it must be without Grudging. What does that mean? You know, underneath, uh, you know, you are saying, this fellow is always coming whenever we're going to eat. He doesn't know any other time to come. It's when you get your salary, he doesn't miss it. I, I don't know how he knows. Immediately you get your salary, just as you are getting home, he knows you cannot tell a lie. Can I have uh, my brother, uh, please, uh, you, know, you know I don't have job. Can you just uh, give me 100 naira there? And you cannot say you don't have. You are having the thing in your pocket. How does he know? And then you reach down, you say, okay, take in uh, brotherly love. But inside your heart you say... Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with this fellow. It's like uh, somebody, a family I heard about, uh, they invited uh, somebody and uh, some people to come and eat. And as uh, they, they were eating, they were to eat on the table. Then the father said, Johnny, uh, pray, for the, pray for the food before we eat. 
And uh, Johnny said, but I don't know how to pray. I, I wouldn't know what to say. And then he, he, the daddy said, just, just pray, just say whatever you have had mommy say. And then the boy said, oh Lord, why did you bring these people on such a day like this? When we didn't have much, we couldn't give out. Because daddy said, just pray, just say what your heart mommy say. And then all those people that came, they knew it was hospitality with grudging. There must be no grudging in your heart. You must not say anything that uh, shows that you don't like their coming. I come to point number three. The prerequisite of laboring for Christ. Prerequisite of laboring for Christ. Here we have in verses 10 and 11. And as every man has, has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability that God giveth, that God in all things, in all things, in all things, may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Here we have uh, the, the Lord telling us about the gifts. And there are two kinds of gifts that are mentioned here. You have serving gifts and then you have speaking gifts. In verse 11, if any man speak, let him speak as oracles of God. And as the gift that evangelizes, the gift that teaches other people, that admonishes other people, that trains other people, that develops the lives of other people, speaking gifts. But then there is serving gift. If any man minister, which means if any man serve, let him serve, let him do it, let him minister as of the ability that God has given him. But then it tells us the purpose of all that we do. Whether it is with speaking gift or serving gift, that in all things, you are singing in all things, you are ushering in all things, you are evangelizing in all things, you are teaching the word of God in all things, in all things that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, and then dominion and praise will be to him forever and ever. I pray that our lives will bring glory and praise to him in Jesus' name. Peter was saying, in the light of the coming of the Lord, uh, we will not fold our hands. That's what some people do well. I know the Lord is coming very soon. Because the Lord is coming very soon, I will be spiritually idle. I will not do anything. No, it's not like that. Because he is coming. Then you'll be occupied until he comes. In Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Reading from verse 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was near to Jerusalem. And because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said unto them, he said, therefore, a certain noble man went into a far country and to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, occupy till I come. That's what the Lord is expecting from you and from me. Hey, don't say I'm not a worker. Why are you not a worker? We're all workers. We don't need special titles. Because before we can work for the Lord, you can evangelize. You can teach people around in your community. You can show them the way of the Lord. You can preach the gospel to them. You can encourage people. You can visit people. You can visit those who are backsliding and encourage them to come back to the Lord. You can encourage the people that are downtrodden in life and lead them to the Lord. We are all workers in the vineyard of the Lord. The prerequisite that uh, we need to have before we are ready for the coming of the Lord is that we are laboring, laboring for the Lord. In Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, reading in verse 44, Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour, as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. He says, you see, he says he's coming, he's coming. And therefore he's requesting, requiring something from you, be ye also ready. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, who is Lord, has made ruler over his household, to give them meat, induces him. Blessed is that servant, whom is Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. That means you never allow anything in your life. Uh, that will say that will make you say i don't think i want to do anything anymore i don't think i want to uh, do this or do that why not you must 
and you cannot uh, retaliate on God. What human beings have done against you? Uh, so and so offended me. Uh, that leader offended me. Uh, fellow workers offended me. And fellow members of the church offended me because of that. I will not do what I ought to have done. I'll not do it for the Lord. Why not? Are you going to revenge on God? Uh, what uh, the people did against you in First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, reading in verse 5. Ye also as living stones, lively stones, are built up a spiritual house. And holy priesthood, it says, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Christ Jesus. Acceptable to God, the things we're offering to God. Remember, in all things, we want to do everything to the praise, to the glory, to the honor of his name. In verse 9, and ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Why that? That ye should show forth the praises of him. Who has called you uh, from out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's telling you that you have something to do. Because the Lord is coming. Then you are involved in the work of the Lord. You are doing everything that will demonstrate that you are giving glory to God. In Philippians chapter 2. Verse 14. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. You are serving the Lord in the church. You are serving the Lord in your community. You are doing something because you know you are a child of God and you are doing it for the honor of the Lord. Do it without murmuring. Do it without disputing. Do it with a correct attitude. A right act. Because you don't know the activity you will do for the Lord just before the coming of the Lord. That he may be blameless and harmless as sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the watch of life. That I may rejoice and you too may rejoice in the day of Christ. That I have not run in vain and that you have not run in vain. Neither labored in vain. That's what the Lord is saying. He's saying it's coming again. Because he's coming again. He wants us to be walking for him till the very end. You don't retire in the service of the Lord. You don't retire in evangelism. You don't retire in prayer. You don't retire in what you are doing to bring honor and glory and praise to the Lord. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 25. Revelation chapter 2, verse 25. But that which ye have, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works. The activities that honor the Lord. The service that honor, honors the Lord. It says, my works unto the end. To him I will give power over the nations. Well, already you have heard today what uh, the apostle is uh, telling us. By the Spirit of the Lord. What's he telling us? He's telling us the end of all things is at hand. All your suffering, whatever you are going through, it will not be forever. The end of all things is at hand. What's the consequence of that? Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, don't leave love behind because you are too active. Have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover a multitude of sins. You'll forgive, you'll forbear, you overlook, and then you move on. You're in fellowship with the brethren, and it is not dry love. Whatever you have, you give to other people. You use hospitality one to another without grudging, without murmuring, without disputing. Every one of us, as every man has received of the gift of God, even so minister the same one to another. One to another, you can do something. The pastor is not there. The leader is not there. And you can help. Go ahead and help. Uh, they didn't put me there. God has put you there. You are good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You are speaking gift. If any man speak, speak at the oracles of God. No false doctrine. No deviation to this side, to this side. Speak as the oracles of God. Do you have serving gift? If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability that God has given him. In everything we do all things, it will be that God will be glorified. I pray God will be glorified in your life. And the devil will be put to shame. And God will have dominion through the activities of your life in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and recommit our lives to the Lord. Occupy till I come. Lord, I will. Lord, I will. And you will live every day. You live every day in the light of the coming of the Lord. It's coming again. It's coming again. It will be very, very soon. Why don't you tell the Lord, oh Lord, help me so that 
I will be what you want me to be. I will do what you want me to do. I'll be in the place you want me to be. I'll not be running about, avoiding this, avoiding that, because of what the people have done, what the people have said against you. Forget everything and begin to serve the Lord afresh and new. Let your life glorify and honor the Lord. 